Excellent. Um, so good afternoon, officially, everybody. Uh, my name is Adara Goldberg, and I am the Executive Director of the Holocaust Resource Center and Human Rights Institute at Kane University. There are many familiar names on the call and some new ones, and we're just really happy to have all of you here with us today for a bit of a pre-Yom HaShoah program um, around Holocaust remembrance and education. Um, so for today, we have author Michelle Weinfeld here to share her story um, of her grandfather's Holocaust survival. Um, Michelle is the author of From Generation to Generation, a memoir of food, family, and identity in the aftermath of the Shoah. Uh, Michelle graduated from the University of Maryland with a master's in finance and has gone on to work as a CPA. Passionate about Jewish learning, um, Michelle is involved with 3GNY, a nonprofit group focused on grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who educate people about the Holocaust through family stories. Michelle's love of history and storytelling drove her to write this debut intergenerational memoir, From Generation to Generation, which interweaves her experiences with anti-Semitism with the story of her grandfather, Poppy, a Holocaust survivor. Um, and I'd like to just start um, before we hand things over to Michelle by acknowledging our partners for today's program. Um, so our partners, thank you to 3G and J and the Raritan Valley Community Institute of Hol Raritan Valley Community College Institute of Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And so Michelle, the floor is yours. We will have time for Q&A afterwards, so you can either feel free to place questions in the chat box while we go, if there's something you don't wanna forget, um, or just hold on to that thought and you'll be able to ask live at the end. Um, so Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Adara, and the entire HRC team for allowing me to come and speak to you all today. And thank you to everyone who showed up to listen to me talk about my favorite person in the entire world and share his story. So as Adara mentioned, I am the author of From Generation to Generation, a memoir of food, family, and identity in the aftermath of the Shoah. I published this book about a year and a half ago at this point and have gone on to do about 30 presentations so far, similar to this, speaking about my grandfather's story, the life lessons he taught me, and a little bit about how being the grandchild of a survivor has influenced my life. As um, Adara mentioned, I'm a CPA. I majored in accounting and finance. This is by no means my full-time job, but ultimately something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And especially as Holocaust survivors are getting older, many of them are passing away or are not in a condition to be able to share their stories. I really believe that it is on the second and the third generation to continue educating about the Holocaust because these are stories that didn't just happen to some people a long time ago. These are stories that happened to my grandfather. This is something that happened to people that you may know or people that you know have family members that were directly affected by this. And if my grandfather who experienced so much darkness and trauma in his life was able to be happy and kind and compassionate, then there's a lot that all of us can learn from him. If he could find darkness or he could find light out of all of this darkness, then I can't imagine how all of us in any of the horrible things that we may experience can't find light in that as well. And a little bit more detail of what my book is about. It's not just my grandfather's story, but ultimately my own as well. I realized as I started writing about my grandfather that you can't write a memoir if it's not about yourself. And there are so many aspects of the person that I am that have been influenced by my grandfather, that have been influenced by what my family has gone through, both the trauma and also the positives, the connection to my family's history, to our traditions, culture, the foods that we eat. 
And um, this is a photo of me and my grandfather cooking together in my parents' kitchen, which is where most of my memories with him took place, um, surrounded by food. So a little bit about my grandfather now. My grandfather, Poppy, for you all to know him in this story, because that's how I know him, was born in Munkoc, Czechoslovakia on July 10th, 1925. Interestingly enough, while Munkoc was in Czechoslovakia where my grandfather was born, because of where it's located in Eastern Europe in the Carpathian mountain region, it's actually changed country many times throughout my grandfather's life. So when his parents were growing up, it was a part of the Austro-Hungarian empire then became part of Czechoslovakia, then became part of the Soviet Union, and is currently in modern day Ukraine. This photo here on the left was taken by my family when we visited Munkoc about six years ago at this point. And my grandfather said that the house looks exactly the same as he remembers it. It is a stone house in a relatively medium sized city for that area. And what's really interesting is usually people think about, you know, growing up in Eastern Europe in the 1920s and 30s, and you expect people to live in shtetls, you expect them to live in these little rural communities in a shack in something that doesn't resemble anything similar to what we live in now. But my grandfather's house was pretty modern. It had five bedrooms, it had a kitchen, it had a living room. They had beautiful fruit trees in the garden in the backyard. And it was a real place that, you know, I could see myself living now. My grandfather's family is featured here on the right. His father, Emmerich, on the back. His mother, Peppy, in the center. His older brother, Yoshka, on the back left. His two sisters, Bella and Sidi in the front row on the left, who are not twins, even though they look quite a bit alike and are dressed the same in this picture. And this little blonde boy in the front is my grandfather, Poppy. And he lived what he referred to as a pretty normal childhood. He lived in an upper middle-class household and his father was a tax collector for the government. His mother stayed at home. What's interesting about this is that while I mentioned they lived in Czechoslovakia, my grandfather's family always identified as Hungarian. And a large majority of this, large part of this is because my great grandfather served in the Austro-Hungarian army as part of World War I. He was actually a war hero in this war, which led him to getting this position in, as a tax collector for the government having a relatively high status job. Everybody in town knew who he was, both Jewish, non-Jewish. They lived in a very mixed neighborhood full of Jewish people, Russian people, German people, Polish people, Hungarians. Everybody kind of lived together. My grandfather loved playing soccer and he played with other boys that lived in the neighborhood. He also spoke a million different languages, picking them up because he spoke, he learned English and Hebrew in school. He spoke Czech in the streets and he spoke Hungarian at home, also picking up bits of German and Russian and Polish as well. Speaking, I think at the maximum language time about seven different languages. And my grandfather went to the Hebrew gymnasium, the largest Zionist school in Eastern Europe where he learned all of his traditional subjects in addition to learning about learning Hebrew, learning about Jewish cultures, Jewish customs, and had a really um, thorough education in all of those aspects. And as he got older, there was anti-Semitism, but it was a little more under the surface. There would be jokes on the radio or on television. There'd be jokes on the radio where he'd hear them in the streets. There were instances where houses would be vandalized a little bit. My grandfather and his family were relatively immune to this because of my great-grandfather's status in the community. 
they had friends that looked out for them when somebody once threw a brick through my grandfather's window, the local neighborhood boys found that person. They said, you don't touch that house. And they had this kind of insulated experience where they weren't experiencing all of the anti-Semitism that existed in Eastern Europe at that time. And they very much believed that the government would look out for them and protect them. I think many Jews at that time did, but ultimately things started to change, started to get worse. Originally Hungary and that Eastern European region had an alliance, or maybe not an alliance, an agreement with the German government saying that they would handle their own Jewish problems separately. Because of this, they had a representation quota. So Jews represented 7% of the population. They couldn't represent more than 7% in any given job category. My great-grandfather kept his job, but they could tell things were starting to get worse. This photo on the right here is the last photo that we have of my grandfather and his family all together. But um, on, in the front are his parents, his sisters next to him, Yoshka on the left and Poppy here on the right. And this photo on the left is an older photo of my grandfather who's on the right and his cousin Mickey who is on the left and Mickey will become a little more important as I continue on with this story. But things started to change. Bella went off to Budapest for college. She was a gymnast, very talented, something not uh, very traditional for women at that time to go to college, but she had this talent that allowed her to go there. Poppy had dropped out of high school during this part of the war. When he was in high school and he became an apprentice at a mechanic. His father thought that this would help him in the war effort if things were to go south and very quickly they did go south. Yoshka was taken to forced labor and they never saw him again. Then it remained just my grandfather, Sidi, and his parents in their house. His family also lived nearby. Mickey, his cousin, among many of his other relatives, all lived in Munkach in the surrounding area. And once Germany invaded Hungary in the spring of 1944, things went south very, very quickly for my grandfather and his family. His father, who had had his job until this point, lost his job. And very soon after that, they were forcibly removed from their home. They were taken, they were sent into the ghetto in the center of Munkach. They had to leave almost all of their possessions behind and they were forced to wear yellow stars. My, I can't imagine what that was like for my great grandmother having to make these stars herself and then pin them on her children. If they got caught without them, there were very serious consequences, potentially even being killed just for not marking that they were Jewish. They left their home with very few of their belongings, some of which they hid in the basement, in the attic, in the yard, some of which they gave to neighbors who they hoped would give them back if they came back to retrieve them. And that was that. They had to go into the ghetto. They went from having this beautiful large house to sharing a one-room apartment with another family. And they remained in the ghetto for a few weeks. They had very little supplies. My grandfather, as you saw in the other picture, had light hair and fairer features, which he thought made him look not stereotypically Jewish. And because of this, he would sneak in and out of the ghetto and try to get food and supplies for his family. This was incredibly dangerous if there was anybody that caught him. Once again, he could have been killed, but fortunately that didn't come to pass. He was safe and he was okay. And he was able to get those supplies for his family, which in his mind made it all worth it. After a few weeks in the ghetto, the ghetto was liquidated. There were people in the ghetto, not just from Munkaj, but from all of the surrounding areas, from the Carpathian Mountains and the other 
towns nearby and they walked a few miles as the ghetto was liquidated to a brick factory that was nearby. They stayed there once again for a couple of days, no food, no water, no bathroom. And then they were loaded onto cattle cars and sent off to Auschwitz. They stayed on the cattle car for a couple of days. Once again, no food, no water, no bathroom, no way to even tell where they were going. And then they finally arrived at Auschwitz. This was the last time that my grandfather ever saw his parents. They were separated into the selection process. So men went on one line, women went on the other. City was sent to Bergen-Belsen, a very infamous concentration camp. His mother was holding her nephew and they thought that she was the mother. So she was sent straight away to the gas chambers. He and his father were separated. His father stayed to work in Auschwitz while Poppy and his cousin Mickey and Mickey's brother Itchy all were sent to be transferred to another camp. Through all of the genealogical research and records that are being released every day, my aunt actually found out that my grandfather, my great grandfather died about a month before Auschwitz was liberated. He survived months of the war and almost made it, but he didn't. From there, my grandfather and Mickey and Itchy all went through the traditional prisoner intake process. They had their heads shaved. They had to give up all of their clothing and were given the traditional prisoner's uniforms, you know, the stripes. They were about the consistency of a potato sack, not very warm, especially um, for the cold winters, but they actually weren't given tattoos of their numbers. And this was because prisoners were being processed so quickly at this point in the war that there was no time to tattoo them. Their heads were shaved and they were sent to Fufenteichen, which is a subcamp of Gross Rosen. And every day in this camp was the same. They woke up, there were no traditional selections, but they did exercises to show that they were capable of working for the day. They were given a small amount of food, a um, little piece of bread with a little bit of butter, if you could even call the bread that. Poppy said it was more like sawdust. Um, and then they went and they walked to the Krupp's munitions factory. So Krupp's is a coffee pot brand, but many of these manufacturing facilities were converted into munitions and other types of materials factories to supply the war effort. And my grandfather said, you know, we would walk to go to the factory. And it's interesting hearing the way that he would talk about it, which was very matter of fact, this is what happened. This is where we went. This is what we did. But hearing other survivors that were in the same camp, reading more and learning more about the experience, I found out that my grandfather didn't just go on a walk. He was between two fences of barbed wire with little room to even move. Outside of that barbed wire, there were soldiers with their dogs that would rip anybody apart if they tried to escape. They worked in 12 hour shifts at the factory and then came right back to the camp. They were given a small amount of soup for dinner, which is more like a little bit of water with maybe a mystery meat or a vegetable floating in it and then they were sent off to bed. The cycle repeated day in and day out from the spring of 1944 into the winter of 1945. And this was a really unique camp given that it was fully a labor camp. This was not an extermination camp or a death camp. There were no selections, there were no crematoriums. And something really interesting about that is that there was actually an infirmary at this camp. So in the winter of 1945, my grandfather's number came up to shovel coal for the camp to heat it. He wasn't given extra food, wasn't given a coat. He just had to shovel to keep the camp running. And because of this, he ultimately fell ill and was sent to the infirmary. 
And in the infirmary, my grandfather didn't get any extra food, but he got a little bit of time to recover. He didn't have to work for a little bit. And what's really interesting is that the doctor in this infirmary was also from Mooncotch and knew about my great grandfather. He recognized Poppy as Emmerich's son. And because of this, he paid a little closer attention to Poppy. He signed off that he was still sick and kept him in the infirmary for a little bit longer and gave him a little bit of extra time to recover before having to go back to work. Around this time, there were also many rumors about Russian soldiers coming to liberate the camp. Everybody had been whispering, but that's also what they had heard when he was in Munkach, that the Russians were coming and then the Russians never made it. So they didn't know whether to believe the rumors or not. But the doctor knew that the camp was being liquidated. And so even though he had to release my grandfather back to the camp, he told him as Poppy was being released that the camp was going to be liquidated because the Russians were coming to liberate them. And my grandfather brought this news back to Mickey and Itchy. And he said, what are we going to do? Ultimately, he and Mickey decided they were going to hide in the camp. They were going to try to avoid the death march. But Itchy did not have the same idea. So they separated. Itchy went on the death march and Poppy and Mickey never saw him again. They ended up hiding in the infirmary. And fortunately, the soldiers that were left behind to see if there were any hiding prisoners didn't check very hard in the camp. They basically walked into the infirmary, took a scan and then walked out. Poppy knew the infirmary relatively well because he had been there. So he and Mickey with some other prisoners were able to hide without being caught. A few days later, the camp was liberated by Russian soldiers. Poppy and Mickey were so relieved, but they had no idea if anybody else in their family had survived. They didn't know what else to do. So they decided that the only thing they could do was go home. They were quite a far way away from home. It was 251 miles from Munkach to Auschwitz. If you look, it says Munkachevo here on the bottom right. Then over here where it says Oswihim with the next white dot, that's about where Auschwitz is. And then Fufenteichen is up here with the red pin. So that's another 133 miles from Auschwitz to Fufenteichen. This is about the same distance as going from New York City to Niagara Falls. And Poppy and Mickey had nothing. They had no food. They had no clothing. They definitely didn't have any money to get a train or an Uber that didn't exist. So they started to walk. And once again, they were lucky. They started to walk in one direction and a Russian soldier came by in a car and said, where are you going? They said, we're going home. We're going back to Munkach. The Russian soldier told them, well, you're going west. You really want to be going east. Otherwise, you're going to walk straight into Germany. If that one little thing didn't happen, they never would have survived. And that's something true across many a survivor story. You hear it all the time. There are little moments that change the trajectory of their lives. There are little moments that saved them. So my grandfather and Mickey turned around. They would hitchhike, which was incredibly dangerous. You never knew who you were getting in the car with. They would stay in abandoned homes, seeing if there was any food or clothing, any money, anything that they could keep to help them on their journey. They jumped on the back of trains, hoping that the trains were going in the right direction. And finally they arrived in Poland which was on their way back. And I'm going to read a short excerpt from the book where it talks about when Poppy and Mickey arrived in Poland. As they arrived in Poland, they knew papers were necessary to continue their voyage. They saw a church in the center of town and decided that it would be the best place to start. 
the priest was kind and welcoming, allowing them to stop and relax for a while. In this time, he was able to acquire papers for them from the local police. The Polish were very religious people, you see. So that's how we chose to go to the church, you know. You know, this guy was the Pope, Poppy noted before continuing his story. We actually thought that he was joking, but looking into where the Pope was at that time, it is actually possible that my grandfather met the Pope. Not confirmed, but I would trust him in just about anything he said. Upon their arrival at the church, the priest asked them if they'd eaten breakfast, and they replied they had not. As they were welcomed into the church, they were greeted by the aromatic saltiness of freshly cooked bacon. The eating area had a long table with a feast laid out across it. Poppy's mouth salivated, thinking about having a warm and filling meal. The table was covered with plates of eggs, fresh rye bread, and bacon. It was nothing like the breakfast he grew up with, but he couldn't take his eyes off the sight of the crispy caramelized bacon before him. He'd never eaten pork before. Jews and bacon, generally an unsightly pairing, especially in my kosher household. In middle school, I became a vegetarian and was never too fond of meat to begin with. The sight and smell of pork nauseated me more than anything else. I would see the grease in lining the pan in a hotel fresh to order kitchen and my stomach would quickly begin to turn. Bacon would just never be for me. For Poppy, on the other hand, bacon was the greatest food in the world. His mouth watered as bacon hit the only non-kosher frying pan in his house. As the bacon began to sizzle and crack, Poppy always thought of the point in his journey home where he and Mickey found refuge in that Polish church. As he told me the story, his eyes lit up. He turned, over, he turned to look over at Mickey for approval, who shrugged and filled his own plate. Mickey was never much for following the rules, and who was Poppy to deny a hot meal? They could probably spin the situation to say they were keeping in the spirit of Kapua Nefesh, watching over the soul, which puts preserving life over following Jewish laws. In reality, they were starving and tired. Keeping kashrut was the last thing on their mind. They piled their plates and felt the greasy crispiness warm their bodies from head to toe. This was the feeling lost throughout the war. Freedom. It took me a long time to understand my traditional Jewish grandfather's love for bacon. To him, bacon wasn't just a food. It was a feeling of freedom that allowed him to open the next chapter of his life. Moving forward, he had to come to a crossroads between the identity he once had and the new life in front of him. A few weeks later, my grandfather and Mickey returned, sorry, a few weeks later, my grandfather and Mickey returned to Mooncotch. There he found his sister, Bella, and a, one of his cousins. He found out that his sister, Siddi, had also survived and was in Budapest. He went to his house, and even though all of the possessions from it were stolen, the house was still standing. He went to one of his neighbors who they had given some of their um, valuables to, and he actually returned them back, saying he was glad that Poppy was okay. Poppy went to another neighbor asking for his other valuables back, and that neighbor said, give me one second. He came to the, the door, pointed a gun at my grandfather's head and said, if you ever come back here, you dirty Jew, I'll shoot your head off. That shows the duality of the reactions um, and the feelings about Jews during this time. My grandfather had survived the atrocities of the Holocaust, and yet he could have easily been killed by his neighbor somebody he may have once considered to be a friend. And this was not uncommon across many survivor stories as well. But after spending a little bit of time in Munkach, Poppy went to Budapest. One of the possessions that he actually kept um, is a Seder plate that his family used during his childhood for Passover. That's the same Seder plate that my family now uses every year on Passover as well. This photo here on the right is a picture of Poppy and his sister Bella in Budapest together. And this photo on the left is Poppy teaching Hebrew at a displaced persons camp. Displaced persons camps were refugee camps set up after the war for survivors of the Holocaust. And they provided food, places to stay for the survivors, helped them see if their families had survived and also provided them with the opportunity to 
immigrate somewhere else if they wanted to leave Europe. My grandfather was planning on going to Israel and ultimately decided to stay in Europe for a little bit longer. Soon after that, he developed spinal tuberculosis in his back and was placed in a body cast for a few months. And after having this, he knew that his back would not survive the hard manual labor or any impending war that would happen. So he figured he would just stay in Europe for a little bit longer. At this point, Bella had gotten married and had a son before immigrating to the United States. And then she asked Poppy if he would come with her. City stayed in Budapest. Her husband was a com member of the Communist Party and wanted to stay for the, the rise of the Soviet Union, but Poppy had nothing tying him there. So he ultimately decided to come to the United States and join Bella here. My grandfather immigrated to the United States in 1950 and then became a citizen in 1955. And something really interesting and funny is that he came over working on a ship. He actually, his job was painting the ice cream freezer. So my grandfather spent his entire journey to the United States eating ice cream inside of a boat. And then upon arriving, Bella and her husband brought my grandfather an American ice cream cone and he threw up off the side of the dock. <laughs> but my grandfather immediately got a job, started working. He lived in the Bronx. And from there, they say kind of the rest is history. Bella introduced him to my grandmother. They met at Thanksgiving and were married basically by Christmas. And from there, they had my aunt and my mother. And from there, my aunt had my two cousins, my mother, my father had me and my brother. And now we're here. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about why I decided to write this book. I know I touched on it a little bit before, but there are so many important lessons that I learned from my grandfather somebody who had a wicked sense of humor, who never held on to hatred or resentment, who was kind beyond words. He do anything for the people that he loved. And family was the single most important thing in his life. He lost so much, but he then was able to rebuild. He was able to have this beautiful, loving family that was both family by blood and by choice. He made a few close friends in the displaced persons camp that were his best friends until the day that they all died. And I just wanted to share a quote from the book before thanking you all and opening it up for questions. The real point of this book, the reason that I do these presentations is to teach people about survivors. Survivors are real people. They're not just characters in a movie. Their lives didn't end at liberation. Their stories continued on. So often in the media and in literature, we see Holocaust survivor stories starting at the moment that the Holocaust started and ending at liberation. But that was only a few year period in for my grandfather, a very, very long life. And I think it's incredibly important to share that he was not this one horrible period of his life, this one horrible thing that happened to him. My grandfather was a real person. He had dreams and hopes and favorite music and favorite movies and foods. And he was a whole person. He wasn't just a two-dimensional character that spanned a couple year period of time. So thank you all so much for listening to me speak today. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you use the QR code, you can also link to my social media, my contact information, and if you have any interest in buying the book. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, 
and you know just for introducing your introducing us to poppy because i think it's very easy um, i know for myself as someone that studies holocaust survivors um, to often become disillusioned and we forget that we're speaking about individuals um, we're not just talking about a mass group of people who've experienced anything in life like you said the good the bad the ugly um and it's just it's very easy for us to fall into that trap and you know many of the folks who are online right now are teachers who are responsible for shaping the next generation and that is a lofty responsibility that they have and i think hearing individual stories um, reminding us that you know every number had a name um had a family and you know i thank you for naming them and for not simply referring to individuals as your grandfather's siblings or their parents, because when I hear that, I cringe inside. Um, they were a person too. And, you know, something that maybe to get us started, I would love to know more about is this role of food in your relationship with Poppy. Um, and was that, you know, how did that come about? Um, was that something you shared with other people or, you know, what did that relationship look like? My grandfather was an incredibly good cook, which is ironic because my grandfather, my grandmother might be the worst cook that I've ever seen. But my grandfather was such a great cook. And every time I would go to his house, he would go, okay, sit down, you know, let's have lunch. And then he would go and he would take out the cookies and you go, have a cookie. And then I would have a cookie. You go, have another cookie. You look too skinny. You need more cookies. And so many of the conversations that we had about his life, about everything took place around his kitchen table. I also loved to learn from him because none of his recipes had measurements. They just had ingredients and then you just do it until it looks right. So this, you know, idea of food is also, it's how I connected with my grandfather, but it's also how I connected with you know, thousands of years of traditions, whether it was baking um, hamantashen with my mom on Purim and then delivering them to people in the neighborhood or, you know, the memories associated with holidays, all of my feelings about Judaism seem to come back to food, which is also then how my feelings about my grandfather go. They kind of go hand in hand. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read the first question um, from Chris. I've worked with many survivors of the Holocaust who have passed away and left us here to carry on their knowledge and understanding. They spoke often of how difficult it was to stand tall in the face of evil. I wonder what they would have to say about the stories we are seeing coming out of Gaza today. Um, Michelle, do you have any thoughts about that? And again, I think that's meant from the perspective of what you think about your grandfather um, not the conflict um, as a whole. Yeah. Um, I mean, my grandfather was a very strong supporter of Israel. He very much believed in the home of the Jewish people. But I also think that he understood suffering. And I don't think that he would have, you know, it's very easy to, when you talk about the Holocaust, when you talk about anything going on in the world, that's happening to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and just seeing them as the numbers as opposed to the individuals that are affected. So I think there is the importance, I mean, basically what Adara said of learning about individuals. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Megan. After your grandfather moved to the U.S., what was the impact of his experience towards the Holocaust on his life afterwards? And how did he cope with those experiences? So my grandfather was an incredibly hard worker, something that I don't, I'm assuming, hopefully would have happened even without the Holocaust, you know, being intuitive and smart and also having the drive to succeed or to create something for himself. But he also, I think because he was a survivor, he didn't have a fear of losing because what could he have lost that was anything more than he already had? Thank you. Um, a message that just came to me 
is when did your grandfather share um, his Holocaust experience with you? I don't remember a specific first time that my grandfather talked about the Holocaust. I feel like it's something I've always kind of known, but I remember being in late elementary school and learning about the Holocaust in Hebrew school. And I asked my grandfather if he would talk to my class. He had never talked to anybody's class about it. He had never really formally told his story. And that's, I think, one of the first times that we all really heard it. And he had been interviewed a few times, but most of those came after. Thank you. Um, Allison has her hand up if you want to unmute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your grandfather with us. I actually just ordered your book <laughs> while we were um, we were doing this. Um, I was wondering if you could actually, um, and this is a very nerdy question, but speak a little bit to the research that you were talking about. It's clear that you've like corroborated and researched some of the stories and things like that. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about what that process was was like for you and and sort of taking that very sterile historical research and, and putting it with your grandfather's very human story. Yeah, so I think that it's a couple fold. I started by primarily just taking verbatim what my grandfather said. I very much do tell his story and there are very few elements of the story. Or there are no elements of the story that are not what, like his it's just that there is some detail added to kind of create more of the vision of like, so you can put yourself in that situation. So I think that there are some incredible resources out there. The um, Arlson archives, there is Yom, um, Yad Vashem has archives. Also the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC has archives as well. And all of those, in addition to others, I believe are available on the 3GNY NJ and or the 3GNY website. So those, I would say, are a great starting point to get that information. And I mostly just use them to supplement the stories that I had heard to provide a little more clarity um, and color to make it feel a little more real because he very much told things in a history textbook laundry list type of way. And I think that that was to protect himself and his own pain. And I think he had to be very neutral as he was speaking in order to do that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna give Adara a little break. There's a question in the, ca uh, in the chat from Doug. Uh, who writes, my grandfather was a survivor who was able to get out of Germany early, though not the whole family, but he rarely ever talked about his experiences. And we really had to glean a lot from passing comments. He would not talk directly. I am curious what your experience was in that you had so much knowledge from him, so many stories. I wish I had been able to ask better questions at the time. And it uh, seemed like fewer interested. Was he willing to revisit so many traumatic events with you? So I guess twofold, um, in my childhood and very much in my mom's childhood, my grandfather, it was passing comments. He never talked about the Holocaust directly with her. He would have his friends that were survivors, um, come over and they would talk and they would drink, but, and they would make jokes or they would make comments that were really dark, but it wasn't really getting into the feelings of it. They're also, I don't remember what the name of it is. There's a television show that is a spoof about Nazis and the Nazis are played. And they're supposed to be like complete idiots. Um, and then there's like Jewish and they would watch this television show, which is about the Holocaust when my mom was a kid sometimes, which was a complete joke about it. Hogan's Heroes, thank you. Um, and my grandfather loved that show, which is interesting. But I think his sense of humor was more how they heard about it. It was very dark and very dry. dry. But um, 
along that, as I got older, I would ask the questions. Nobody else ever asked him really specific questions on it. And I think he had a little bit of a hard time saying no to me. But he, even when I went to ask him specific things for the book, he would only share things on his own timeline. He would, if I got maybe struck a chord, hit a nerve somewhere, he would go, what is there to say that hasn't been said before? And it was his way of saying that all Holocaust survivors have had these experiences. Why do we need to tell his story? Why does he need to be the one to do it? But ultimately, most of the time, he would come back at some other point and make reference and answer the question. But it may be, you know, three days, three weeks later. Um, so it was a lot of piecing together things that weren't in chronological order, but ultimately um, a lot of the details and the big stories. Um, we have, uh, somebody's just pointing out that Hogan's Heroes was Thank about you, World Kathy. War II. Yes. Okay. Um, and I've then never there's... seen it, but I've heard about it. Um, <laughs> and it's funny that my grandfather and my mom liked the show. <laughs> I, I love the fact that that your grandfather dealt with this with with sarcasm. I think um, that's a, it, it's a way that a lot of us understand how to deal with trauma. I think, and it makes it more relatable because we'll never relate to this. Um, kind of piggybacking off the last question, Terry wants to know about the psychological impact um, that may, your grandfather may have had reliving his story in his life, um, and if he ever made it feel as though or show you that it was healing, and how. Um, and if not, how do you cope with the dark side of telling his story? What, what impact does it have on you? I think that um, I'm not exactly sure how it impacted him. I think that he kind of knew that he had to and actually really dark. Um, I would go to my, this was during COVID that I was doing this research and writing this book and I asked him the questions and I would go there. And the last time that I went to his house, um, I went and I asked him the questions and he like really wasn't feeling well. And I went, Poppy, I'm going to go home. Like, I, I got everything. Like, I'm going to finish the book. And I called him the next day and I told him, or I called him that day and I said, I finished that book. And he died literally the next day, which is um, incredibly sad, but also kind of poetic. And I think that it was his way of saying, I've, I've done it now. And there was a part of him that said that he needed to help me do this or he needed to do this for me maybe not even for himself and then once he did that he was able to let go and he was able to make that decision um himself and then I guess on my side it's really hard to talk about all of this it's you know I've always been interested in holocaust literature and for I guess good reason but telling his story Yes, in many aspects, it's very dark and it's very hard, but also the fact that I get to keep my grandfather alive in the memories of so many people who have never met him, but they now know him, um, brings a lot of light. And then hopefully, you know, using this as an education for people, we can enable, we can allow people to learn from the past so history doesn't repeat itself. Julia? Yes. Um, just moving forward with this, I had a question. Um, how do you think that your um, like familial relation has, I guess, this always sounds tough to say, but like made you more interested and like more fascinated with the Holocaust in general. For those who don't have a familial um, sort of connection. Do you have any advice, I guess, for starting points, for starting to understand, you know, I think that for many of us learning about the Holocaust, we kind of learn about the Holocaust period in time, and we don't necessarily, like you mentioned earlier in your quote, like the survivors continue on with their lives. How would you, I guess, recommend someone or any of us here to become more 
informed about the lives of survivors after the Holocaust? And is there anything that you found in your research that would kind of bring this connection more forward and to be more accessible for people who don't necessarily have um, their family members to tell them stories? Where should like we go to get this kind of information? I mean, besides reading your book, of course, but um, any other information like, would be really appreciated. Thank you. I think um, there are a lot of books coming out now that are written by 3Gs. I think a lot of them also do touch on, you know, a little more of their grandparents' stories. If we want to go back to firsthand accounts, I love Edith Edgar. I, she, she wrote The Choice. It's an incredible, incredible book. And she became a, um, she the speakers talks all about this, her and also Eddie Jaco. Um, he wrote, I think, The Happiest Man. What is this book called? Eddie Jacob, he's also incredible. And they both talk about, oh, and Victor Hugo. Sorry, now I'm just going off on tangent. These are three different authors, all absolutely incredible, who have written um, amazing books, three different um, survivor stories. And so Victor Hugo, I said Victor Hugo, sorry, that is the wrong book. Um, I'm, I'm tangenting a little bit because I get kind of excited talking about the different, um, Victor Frankl. So Victor Frankl wrote very much in a very, very famous um, book. But the point of this was that it takes a psychological approach to the Holocaust, which is just very interesting to get perspective and talking about good and evil and showing that even in, you know, even in the evil, there was still sometimes good. And even within the good, there was still sometimes evil and then understanding the long-term impact. So those three, man's search for meaning. Thank you. So Victor Frankl, um, Edith Edgar, and Eddie. I think that that's, I don't think that's how you spell Eddie Jacko, but. Thank you. And then um, Jessica has a question as well. So just if you want to unmute yourself and just ask away. Thank you. I'm excited to read your book now. Um, I love that it's it's bittersweet and happy and, and you tell stories, you know, it's, it's funny and it's your life and it's all of that. And it's got all of the, um, the serious pain that went along with it. And I just wanted to say, so so I'm the daughter of a survivor as well. And um, but my father, who we call Pop, so he's, he's, he's my poppy. Um, our whole lives, he, he told his story. But we never thought of it as a story of the Holocaust. It was just Pop's life growing up, right? It never, it, it was a story of the Holocaust, but it was mixed in with the food that he ate and the jobs that they had and the, the uh, the people that we knew, right? And anybody who came from Danzig, where he came from, was our family because then it would be well, nobody else made it out, and that would lead to another story of the Holocaust. Um, and it wasn't until so much later in life, when we were much older, that my family and I was like, we need to, we need to, we didn't do what you did. We need to get this story down because this is a, this is an important history, not just our story, but it was our story, right? Our family story. Um, luckily, for the, the help of the Holocaust Resource Center, we were able to document that story. But was there a time for you that you thought, this is just my family's story, right? Some people grew up in New Jersey. Some people's family came from, from uh, Poland. Some people's family came from different places. It, we didn't immediately realize. And there was a lot of humor in the stories as well. We still laugh as we tell all the stories because it's just part of our family history. Was it a time that you realized? this is more than just my family's story and it's okay obviously you did because you decided i've got to capture it all and share it i'm sorry could you repeat that last bit i um got a little cut out oh so i'm just saying at some point did you just feel like this is just my family's story these are just my my poppy's stories versus this is such an important historical event that i must document and 
can't share because it's not just his story. It's not just my family's oh. story. Yes and no. I've always wanted to write it down. And even if it was only for the people in my family, that would have been enough. But I've also seen this as why would it just be for me? Like, I don't, I don't want this to be a gate kept thing in any way. I think that hearing survivor stories, the more, you know, the more individuals are associated with the number the more you understand the incre- like the severity of it, the sheer luck that any single one of them made it out. And I completely understand, you know, it being your own. And I would be, it would be enough if it was just ours, but the opportunity to share it with anybody else just, feels really important to do. Agreed, agreed. And, and when my father worked for the Holocaust Resource Center, it 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 even changed for him, um, being able to share it in a way and be able to show how his philosophies on life were formed by it um, and his positive outlooks. And at times, uh, that, that's how he chose to, you know, to, uh, to deal with it, give him a positive, grateful outlook, but everyone didn't. And so being able to formally share it really made it that for him and for all of us. Thank you for sharing your story. I think we've just got one last question for you, which is, um, did you ever get to meet any of Poppy's other family members? So Mickey, his cousin he went through the war with, I'm still very close with Mickey's daughter. She and I uh, sometimes cook together, which is nice. And it's interesting. People talk about, you know, family And they say, oh, I don't have a big family. I don't really have a big family either. My mom is one of two. My dad is one of three. But we keep in touch with our third, fourth cousins. Cousins that we don't even know how we're related to. We still see, have a relationship with. Um, So my grandfather has a first cousin who we still have a relationship with the first cousin's children and grandchildren. When we went to Munkach, um, we went to Budapest first and Sidi's family lives in Budapest now and we stayed with them. We also, um, on that same trip, went to Prague and found out that my grandfather had a cousin, we don't even know how we're related to them, that lives in Prague. And we ended up having dinner with them and we talk to them now sometimes. So yes, I've met met family members, both those who are local, those who are very close in terms of blood relation and also those who somewhere down the line are related to us, but we don't really know how. Well, I just want to say thank you. Um, For those of you who don't know me, I am the vice president of uh, the Diversity Council and Adara's biggest fan. Um, But I just want to thank you on behalf of the Holocaust Resource Center and the Diversity Council and all of the other sponsors of this program for sharing um, Poppy's story with us and and especially for the educators present of showing us, you know, different ways that we can use 2G and 3G stories in our classroom to not only teach about the Holocaust, but to give them the larger picture of of the joy that was possible afterwards, because I think that's one of the greatest signs of resistance um, and revenge that we can see. So I I just wanna thank you so much um, for sharing that with all of us. Um, If you are a student in Adara's class, uh, please stay on the Zoom. If you are a student in my class, please join me in our Zoom. Um, And on behalf of all of us, just thank you very much for sharing your story today. Thank you all so much for having me and for asking such wonderful and insightful questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. We really appreciate it.